You are listening to the Foreign Policy Focus Podcast. We cannot wait for the final proof. The smoking gun could come in the form of a mushroom cloud. Haven't you driven enough people from their homes already? Bulldoze their villages, seize their property under law as they had no part in making. Now working in Libya with friends and allies, we've demonstrated what collective action can achieve in the 21st century. Now the host of the show, Kyle Inslee. This is episode 267 of the Foreign Policy Focus podcast. For today's show, I have an interview that I did on the Around the Empire podcast. The host of the show is Joanne Leon. She's been a guest on my show several times. I've been a guest on her several times, so I'm sure all of you are familiar with her. But she approaches the non-interventionism from a left-wing perspective, but is just great in you know going and pulling out little details. And that's really what we go through and cover about this situation with the Iranian drone, the possible American response, and just how crazy the conflict has gotten now between the U.S. and Iran, and uh, some of the other different players in the Middle East we go into, and just how they can affect or are possibly behind some of the escalations going on. I think this show really complements the past two episodes of Foreign Policy Focus well. Uh, The first, of course, was that live stream that I did with Will Porter and Steve Waskow, and then the past episode was an interview uh, from the Peace and Liberty podcast that's hosted by Stephen Clyde, and the guests were myself and Will Porter, and so this one is me and Joe and Leon, again, covering the Iran thing, but it's just such an important issue, and especially when you look at some of the reports that suggest, you know, the Americans, you know, our Army and Navy and Air Force were getting ready to carry out strikes against Iran on Thursday, and Donald Trump pulled that back. It could have been his last minute as he was convinced by Tucker Carlson and Douglas McGregor. And so me and Lo- Joanne Leon have that clip in this episode as well. And, you know, we kind of talk about the importance of that perspective, especially in convincing the president. So again, here comes this uh, fantastic interview. I hope you all enjoy it and take the time, you know, to share the show, even if it's not from the foreign policy focus uh, link, make sure you do it from the Around the Empire link. And, oh, and me and Joanne had thought that if our audience probably don't overlap too much, but if they do and everybody's getting duplicates in their feed, uh, then just send an email and in the future we can only run it on one feed. So thanks everyone. I really hope you enjoy this one. Kyle Anzalone is here talking to us from Massachusetts, right, Kyle? That's right. And I just want to say congratulations, Joanne. I think this is the first time that's been on since you crossed 100 episodes. And, you know, that's quite a landmark. And I hope all of your uh, listeners take the time to think about supporting your show, just because I know how much work goes into making 100 podcast episodes, especially when you do with you do inserting different clips in and stuff like that to really raise the production quality. So uh, make sure everybody shows their appreciation to Joanne for all the hard work that she's doing. I'm sure, you know, the, the more money that's rolling in, the easier it is to dedicate more time to these kind of projects. So uh, I really enjoy your content, Joanne. I've, you know, been very appreciative to being guests on your show so many times, and uh, I hope to be a guest as frequently in the next 100 episodes. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kyle. And I love having you and Will on as guests and uh, – and just kind of mixing it up and, you know, offline the way we sort of bounce things off of each other or share the things that we have come up with. And, um, you know, Kyle has a foreign policy focus and he somehow produces three of these every week. I don't know how you do it, Kyle. Uh, and have a, you know, an, a day job too. I mean, that's just amazing. So I ditto to everything that you just said for, for your podcast and for all independent media. Um, yeah, this isn't easy and we need, we need your support. I mean, it just boils down to that. It's really, really simple. Right. And, and the things that, you know, we're going to cover on today's show in the analysis that me and Joanne are able to provide about, you know, Iran are because people like Joanne Leone and you look at maybe, uh, the moderate rebels podcast and the Scott Horton show, where, you know, they interview people like Elijah Manier and Peter Ford and all these great analysts that are never going to be on Fox News. So if you just watch TV, you're never going to see or hear these people's perspectives 
but it's extremely important if you want to understand the nuances of the region and have a more comprehensive and better idea of what's going on in the Middle East rather than whatever talking points, you know, CNN is going to give you from probably three people from think tanks funded by weapons makers, uh, you know, oil production companies and different kind of lobbyist group and uh, special interests from overseas rather than getting like just investigative journalists like, you know, Gareth Porter, Elijah Manier and, and Bernard Moon of Alabama who do such a good job of getting all the little details. Exactly. It's pretty interesting. The sort of informal network, you know, that that has formed and I'm sure there are others out there that we don't know about uh, that are doing the same kinds of things. But speaking of mainstream media, Kyle and I, and, and I've been talking about this online for anybody who's seen my Twitter feed, uh, there was just a stunning, some stunning developments uh, yesterday and last night, particularly things are moving so fast that it's, it's difficult to understand what's going on. Plus, you know, you kind of have to, read between the lines on a lot of things. You have to sort of gather what is going on, what information you're getting from other people, because, you know, the the media is used uh, as a tool for not just for propaganda or, and things like that, but it seems like states are using the media to to wage hybrid war. You know what I mean? They're putting things out in the media to get a message across to other countries and things like that. So, you know, it, it's not just a straight read is what I'm saying. You have to sort of consider a lot of things when you try to uh, determine what you think is going on. And so last night there were two, at least two, but two that I'm going to point out, two particularly interesting developments. One of them was the first two segments on Tucker Carlson's show and on Fox News. And you have to remember that Fox News is, you know, it's the conservative channel, but Tucker is sort of taking a different road here. He's sort of more on the, the Trump anti-interventionist bent, you know, at least that's the stance that he's been taking. And he had on a guest named Fred Flights. Fred Flights is a, a close associate of John Bolton, from what I can tell, because there was a, he was on a radio show earlier this week talking to Seth Gorka, another character, and they were going out of their way to defend John Bolton. And as most people know, John Kiriakou wrote an article recently, maybe a week or two ago, saying that John Bolton was on thin ice, you know, that John Bolton, it was likely he's going to be fired. The White House was already interviewing people to replace him and uh, and so on. And so, you know, it was still based mostly on rumor. So, you know, I wasn't sure. So I went looking around, you know, we haven't seen John Bolton on the media lately. He's, he was very uh, visible during the Venezuela coup attempts and he so has sort of disappeared from media. So I went looking around to sort of make sure that, that that was true. I couldn't find any Bolton media appearances, but I found two radio show appearances and they both uh, had a goal of boosting, you know, praising and defending John Bolton. So this guy, Fred Flights, who was on Tucker last night, very recently was on a radio show with Seth, Seth Gorka, you know, talking about how great John Bolton is and, and so on. I could, should I play that clip, Kyle, or, or no? Yeah, let's hear that clip now. I think that'll be a good way to get rolling into all this. My name's Sebastian Gorka. We are back with our third in-studio guest today. That might be a record. It is none other than Fred Flights, president and CEO of the Center for Security Policy and former chief of staff of the National Security Council under Ambassador John Bolton. Welcome to America First, Fred. Dr. Gorka, it is great to be here. Do not call me Dr. Gorka here. <laughs> it's Sebastian, it's Seb, uh, whatever you All prefer. All right, sounds good. All right, otherwise I'm going to have to call you Mr. President Flats. <laughs> um, okay, we, we could have so much uh, to discuss here today. We've got two segments. Um, I want to talk about Iran in the second segment because that's on everybody's. If you're into national security, that's on, on your front burner. But first things first, how long have you known Ambassador Bolton? 
Well, I've known him since the late 1980s when he was Assistant Secretary of State for International Organizations. I was with the CIA for 19 years, and I was the UN analyst. And, and he was? And he was he was at State handling UN issues. Right. And then he became? And then he became Under Secretary for Arms Control in, in the second Bush administration, and he brought me from the CIA to be his chief of staff. And then when he went to the National Security Council, he asked me to, to be his chief of staff again. Okay. So you know this man. Uh, <laughs> that is – we have to assert your credentials first because I'm kind of fed up of people on our side, on the conservative side, who I address on the radio show when they call in, I address on sh- social media every day, who talk to me about this dastardly neocon, John Bolton, who's just making sure that we go to war with sundry countries, including Iran. Could you dispel these accusations and tell our listeners across the nation who John Bolton really is, Fred Flights? Well, it, it's really absolute nonsense. He really is an America first guy. He is not a neocon. Neocons believe in nation building, and Mr. Bolton doesn't believe in that. Uh, and I might add on the Iraq war, you hear all the time that, that uh, John Bolton was the warmonger who got us involved in the war. The fact is that's just not true. I was his chief of staff at the State Department, Colin Powell – kept him out of all of the deliberations, all the information to start that war. Remember, Colin Powell went to the CIA to look at the intelligence that led us to go to the war. Colin Powell went to the Security Council to get us into the war. Colin Powell got us into the war. John Bolton did not. And in fact, Bolton says in his memoirs, cutting him out of the pre-war deliberations by Powell was one of the greatest favors Powell ever paid him. <laughs> well, who was the person who waved around a test tube at the U.N.? I think, that, I think that was Colin, Colin Powell. Powell. Yeah. It wasn't That's John right. Bolton. And Bolton wasn't there. Uh, so so for you, if you had to describe his philosophy when it comes I, – I know he's an incredibly hard worker. He gets up at four. He reads the briefs. He prepares and then he goes to work. Uh, who is John Bolton? In ter- if you had to categorize him, what is his philosophy for Fred Flights? Well, his worldview is, is looking out for the interests of the American people and our nation. And it's very, very close to America first. He's a critic of globalism. He does not believe that the U.N. should be setting our rules, should not be uh, trumping our laws. In fact, he says many times the U.S. Constitution trumps the U.N. Charter. It's very important to him that the U.N. is a tool but is not a global government. And the United States does not have to defer to an organization that is uh, basically run by anti-American countries, communist countries, socialist countries – hostile dictatorships. That's been very important to Mr. Bolton. Uh, So without talking out of school, this is a philosophy that sits incredibly well with a president whose bumper sticker is make America great again and America first and peace through strength. These would seem like completely simpatico with Ambassador Bolton's worldview. It's a very good fit. And I think that's why uh, John Bolton has gotten along so much better with the president than H.R. McMaster and Secretary of State Tillerson did because they seem to be pushing some other agenda. Another thing, Seb, that's really important to recognize, John Bolton takes his orders from the president. And, and he speculated widely when he was a pundit. But when people argue right now, well, this article you wrote years ago is is inconsistent with maybe something that the president believes in. He says, look, I work for the guy who won the election. I implement his policies. Within 40 minutes of the president tweeting out that Ambassador Bolton is the replacement for General H.R. McMaster, he gave an interview at Fox, still with his Fox hat on, and he was constantly being pushed by the host. So what what kind of national security advisor are you going to be? Trying to push him into a box, trying to categorize him. And and John finished his interview. It's, It's up on YouTube. People need to watch it. He finished it with a very interesting statement. He said... He was discussing a, a prior president and his national security advisor who said, the one thing one never forgets is who was elected president, and it's not the national security advisor. We are talking to Fred Flights. He is the president and CEO of the Center for Security Policy, former chief of staff to Ambassador John Bolton at the National Security Council. Follow him at Fred Flights, F-L-I-T-Z. I'm Sebastian Gorka. This is America First. So... <laughs> Uh, you know, it sounds like a an urgent defense of John Bolton. I don't know what what do you what did you hear? Yeah, so 
I guess, first of all, who listens to that show? Because the banter is absolutely insufferable. <laughs> I, I just, like, I can't imagine anybody should ever want to listen to these two clowns. Uh, you know, like, they have no personality whatsoever. And yet, there are two people that are heavily involved in making America's foreign policy. And so when people are, are very skeptical of the position that we put forward, Joanne, because, oh, it's so outside of the mainstream and everything... Well, I, I, it makes more sense to me when you realize it's dopes like this who are making the foreign policy. Um, a couple of things from that. I guess the statement that John Bolton is a neocon is kind of actually true. And I've in the past, you know, have called John Bolton a neocon because I just like call it, you know, John Bolton things that makes him mad. And in the sense that I want to get across that a neo like a mainstream neocon is a really bad warmonger, right? Yeah. And so yeah. in that sense, John Bolton is a neocon. Uh, when you, when I talk to like the normal libertarian, that's what they think. And it, it makes sense to them to label it that way. In reality, I guess John Bolton doesn't believe in, in regime change wars, just destroying his enemy. However, I, I mean, that's going to morph into staying anyways, because if you create this massive power vacuum, then you're going to have to stay or else your enemies are, are going to fester there. Or, or at least, you know, John Bolton would certainly perceive that way. You know, we went and we killed Saddam Hussein, but created Al Qaeda in Iraq. And so that became the enemy that we then had to stay for. And while John Bolton might not advocate for regime change operations, I th certainly think he, uh, you know, believes in forever wars. And so I guess it's just forever bombing the country, never rebuilding it. Um, uh, the one interesting thing here, and I think you're going to play that clip of Tucker Carlson uh, later, is that he tries to put forward that John Bolton believes in the American first foreign policy. But th that's really not the case. And he says that John Bolton is not a fan of globalism. Again, that's not the case. John Bolton is a huge fan of globalism. It's just American globalism, uh, imperialism, yeah. right? He believes that America needs to control everything that's going on in every corner of the globe uh, to ensure American safety. And that is one of his highest priorities as a, a, just in government. And I think he believes that's like a high moral standard as well, that that's what the United States should be doing all the time. Time, and that's not an American first foreign policy. If you want to look at an actual American for, first foreign policy, that comes from Tucker Carlson. And, you know, he he says, like, well, what are the American interests over there when he can't find them? And, you know, when he realizes that, oh, th there's really no reason to do this, he says, then we back off and we focus on things at home. And I, not that I support everything that Tucker Carlson says, but I do understand why some libertarians uh, were very interested in Tucker Carlson and Donald Trump for a time, uh, because they at times do really have and express these views that say, you know, we're, we're not about going around the world and imposing American, uh, you know, rules on every single person. Uh, but that is what John Bolton believes in doing. And that's why it's such a threat to have him as the national security advisor. Yeah, exactly. I think the best way to describe Bolton would probably be imperialist, as you as you said. But I mean, he's been aligned with the neocon faction for a long time. I mean, he was, I think, a, a PNAC signatory and things like that. I think the best I can tell that, that Bolton is a is an imperialist. You know, he's all about the empire. And the empire should prevail and and just maximizing use of the strength of the empire. Um, for what exact goals, I don't know. I don't think the man is very stable. But the neocons, it seems to me, are less imper The reason why they seem imperialist is because they like to use the empire uh, as a tool, you know, to to achieve their goals. So in terms of foreign policy, whether their labels match up or not, their foreign policy matches up pretty well. The the other point that, um, you know, his longtime friend really tries to make here is that John Bolton's policy and what he says is reflective of what Donald Trump believes and that he works for the president to carry out the president's foreign policy. I think if we look at the history and past actions of John Bolton that include threatening the head of the OPCW in the Bush term and uh, being notorious for screaming at analysts and trying to get rid of and fire analysts who are unwilling to put forward uh, the policy prescriptions that he wants – 
that we know he's probably undermining Donald Trump and and is heavily influencing the policy in in very underhanded ways. Uh, We've at least heard reports that Donald Trump wasn't receiving his daily briefing, that Donald Trump got that, and then he passed that along to Donald Trump. So what kind of of filter do you think uh, and spin John Bolton gives the news before he passes it along to Donald Trump? And uh, so that that's very concerning to me. And I, I think the reason that they're pushing that maybe is because I, I think there's even a lot of Trump supporters that are very skeptical of John Bolton. I mean, it doesn't take somebody who's even heavily, you know, into you know foreign policy and global politics to hear that, hey, John Bolton canceled uh, or helped to cancel the agreed framework with North Korea, the anti-ballistic missile treaty with Russia and the INF treaty with Russia. Hmm, this guy seems to do a lot of things that end up with countries making and having more nuclear weapons. And oh, look, he told and helped Donald Trump get out of the nuclear deal with Iran and impose oil sanctions against Iran, pushing further uh, Iran out of the nuclear agreement. Maybe this guy is just a lunatic who likes nuclear weapons. I don't know. But it, it, it certainly seems that you could just put that in front of anyone and they start to understand that. So maybe that's why they're trying to really uh, help John Bolton's image there. Yeah, I think it bolsters the idea that or the rumor that John Bolton is on his way out. And uh, Seb Gorka at the beginning, he, you know, he expresses his concern that people on their own side, their own friends are uh, calling out John Bolton. And I suspect that there are a lot of people saying, fire John Bolton. And they certainly don't want that to happen because that's their, that's their cronies. That's, you know, through Bolton, uh, their cronies, you know, get power. This might be a good time to transition to that Tucker Carlson segment yesterday, which um, I have to say that he, he has two guests. First, he does this intro. You know, I guess he does like an opening monologue or whatever. But he uses that opening monologue, really, in my opinion, to set up this guy, Fred Flights, who's coming in for an interview, right? His very right after his intro, he's doing an interview with this guy, Fred Flights, who you just heard on that radio show. And then immediately after Fred Flights, he brings in McGregor. And so basically, Tucker uses the intro to set up Fred Flights for failure. Then he proceeds to fricassee the guy during the interview then he brings mcgregor on and they both just completely trash an aggressive policy against how how and just show how insane war would be uh with iran and during that mcgregor says that trump needs to fire the warmongers he actually said use the term warmongers this is a retired army colonel and you know, obviously he's talking about John Bolton, right? And they just had John Bolton's crony and defender, Fred Flights, on just, you know, a minute before him. He's right there and maybe right there in the studio with him. I don't know if they were both. One of them might have been on Skype. I'm not sure. Since 9-11, the U.S. has spent trillions of dollars and thousands of American lives trying to remake the Middle East in our image. It's sad to say it out loud, but we have to. It hasn't worked. Many of us thought it would, but it hasn't. By every measure, our foreign wars have ended in dismal failure for the United States, however noble their intentions. And some did have noble intentions. Donald Trump was one of the rare Republican politicians honest enough to admit this. He said it out loud three years ago and promised not to repeat the same mistakes if elected president. And partly because he said that, he was elected president. Now something fascinating is happening. The very people, in some cases literally the same people, who lured us into the Iraq quagmire 16 years ago, are demanding a new war, this one with Iran. The president, to his great credit, appears to be skeptical of this, very skeptical. Iran recently downed an unmanned American drone. The president, speaking today, seemed to suggest this shouldn't necessarily trigger a conflict with Iran. Watch. Iran made a big mistake. Uh, This drone was in international waters, clearly. We have it all documented. I would imagine it was a general or somebody that made a mistake in shooting that drone down. And fortunately, that drone was unarmed. It was not, there was no man in it, and there was no, it was just, it was over international waters, clearly over international waters, but we didn't have a man or woman in the drone. We had nobody in the drone. 
It would have made a big difference, let me tell you. It would have made a big, big difference. I find it hard to believe it was intentional, if you want to know the truth. I think that it could have been somebody who was uh, loose and stupid that did it. So that's not nearly bellicose enough for the permanent foreign policy establishment in Washington, many of whom crave a war with Iran and see every provocation as an opportunity to start one. Senator Lindsey Graham, for example, says Americans ought to be ready to fight and die for shipping lanes on the other side of the world. Watch. So here's what to watch for. If the Iranians uh, follow through on their threat to start enriching again at higher levels to basically um, take their enrichment program to a uh, kind of a nuclear level in terms of weapons grade production, Israel's in a world of hurt. So the best thing the president can do is stop that. And how do you stop that to make Iran understand you're not going to let that happen? Uh, I think he should put their oil refineries on a target list, that he should look at sinking the Iranian Navy if they attack ships. Again. Uh-huh. So in Washington, there are no real consequences for being wrong. And as a result, policymakers are. They make the same mistakes again and again. And it's certainly not just Lindsey Graham. At The New York Times, left wing warmonger Brett Stevens is also calling on America to sink the Iranian Navy. Many on the left are for it. John Bolton cheers him on from within the White House. Bill Kristol nods with approval from outside the White House. None of these people will admit their actual intentions. I'll tell you, they don't really want a war with Iran. That's a crock. They want a war badly, badly enough to lie about it. That's why they're putting American troops into situations where conflict is inevitable in order to start a war. Everyone in Washington knows exactly what's happening. They've seen it many times before. Fred Flights is a former National Security Council chief of staff and former CIA analyst, and he joins us tonight. Mr. Flights, thanks very much for coming on. Why do you suppose that if, when you look at the polling data on this question, conflict with Iran, almost nobody outside Washington favors a conflict with Iran, and yet the entire foreign policy establishment in D.C. seems open to it. Why the disconnect, would you say? Well, not all of it. I don't want a war with Iran, and I know that this president was elected to get us out of wars and not to start new wars. I think the president was right to pull us out of the fraudulent nuclear deal with Iran. But, you know, there's people saying right now that the president is responsible if Iran responds with violence because we withdrew from that deal. Well, that's a fraudulent argument, too. We don't stay in agreements because the other party threatens to respond with violence. The president has responded with restraint. He's given an opportunity to de-escalate the situation. I think he's, he handled it right today. Well, we're not de-escalating the situation by definition, right? I mean, we're, we're sending additional troops to the region, which is the definition of escalating the situation. And we're doing it, as I think you know, because a lot of the people who are behind it would very much like to see an open conflict with Iran. Why don't we just say that out loud? I believe there's strong intelligence of increased threats from Iran. But the president does not want to use force. He does not want to go to war. But the use of force is on the table if Iran threatens our interests. That doesn't mean the president's going to do this, but the president can't ignore clear intelligence that Iran is planning to respond with violence to his policies. This president's not going to give in to blackmail, but he does not want to use force if he doesn't have to. But uh, what's the point of all this? I, I, I guess I've lost sight of that. I mean, Iran doesn't appear to be a threat to the United States. And there's a lot of talk about how it is. I, I don't remember any Americans dying in terror attacks backed by Iran since the Iran nuclear deal. I, I, we're, in, we're energy exporters now, so it's not clear why the Persian Gulf is at the center of our strategic thinking. We face a lot of other threats, namely from China. Why are we so focused on Iran? I'm confused. I think those are good arguments. The president decided to increase our military presence in the region because of intelligence that Iran was responding to his policy to pull out of the Iran deal with violence. So he's preparing to defend our interests. That doesn't mean he's going to attack. And look, you've talked to the president about this. I've talked to the president about this. He's been very clear. He does not want a war with Iran. He wants a peaceful resolution. But unlike Barack Obama, where the use of force was never on the table, it is on the table with this president, but he's not going to use it unless he absolutely has to. But you could very easily see this slipping beyond his control or anyone's control. I mean, we're, 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 we're trying to provoke a war. I mean, I, I, again, I don't think anybody watching this carefully is going to mistake it for something else. I mean, that's what's happening. We're pushing for a war with Iran. And I'm just wondering, like, what exactly would we get out of that? And when Americans are killed in that war, what will we say to their families? Why did they die? Because 
of what cause? I, I honestly don't understand. Well, I, I think when you say we're pushing for a war, you're talking about all the president's advisors in the foreign policy establishment. The president makes our foreign policy. And you know the president does not want a war with Iran. I understand he told you that recently. I've discussed it with him, too. He does not want a war with Iran, and he's not going to let anyone push him into a war with Iran. But if Iran is preparing to attack our forces, commit acts of terror, the president does a responsible thing in preparing to defend our interests. That's what's going on here. When was the last time Iran committed an act of terror against Americans? Well, Iran was responsible for a, a, a terrorist attack of, the, of a bombing of a train. Well, it was, it was going to be a bombing of a train from Toronto to the United States in 2011. Iran was also behind the, an attack, well, a planned attack to kill the Saudi ambassador to the United States, also during the Obama administration. But, I mean, look. Those may or may not be good arguments, Tucker, but that's not what's at stake here. Right. So, so there are, aren't any Americans who've been killed by Iran in, in recent memory in this generation. So I just, I don't, again, How about in Iraq? I, I, How about with, in with Iraq? Res- How about the IEDs with, in Iraq? With, with, with respect, I don't understand why so much disk space is being devoted to Iran when there are all these other threats. But it's the, it's the new intelligence sure. that Iran has been planning yeah. attacks against the U.S. and our allies. That's what's right. at stake here, not these other issues you've raised. Okay. Mr. Bites, thank you very much. Good to see you. Good to be here. Douglas McGregor is a former U.S. Army colonel and author of Margin of Victory. He joins us tonight. Colonel, thanks a lot for coming on. Um, I don't want to be paranoid, but I've watched this before. It does seem as if the president is strongly opposed to conflict with Iran. He knows it will define his administration. He knows that it doesn't serve American interests, but that people who work for him are pushing the United States into a position where war is very likely, if not inevitable. Am I imagining this? No, I, I don't think you are. Uh, I think the president has had his first Vietnam moment. He was walked up to the edge. He looked into the abyss and he said, no, thank you. Uh, he followed his instincts, thank goodness, and walked back. Uh, he has no interest in going to war, but you are right. He is surrounded by people in the Defense Department, in the chain of command, in his own National Security Council staff, in the State Department, who are absolutely committed to finding ways to attack Iran. I think think the President understands that uh, an attack on Iran would result in an all-out war. The notion of limited strikes is absurd. The Iranians would respond with everything they have because their economy is in ruins, their backs are against the wall. He knows that. He doesn't want that. So we should be grateful. At the same time, I think the President has begun to figure out Wars destroy presidencies. War destroyed LBJ. War destroyed, yes. ultimately, uh, uh, W, uh, George W. Bush. He doesn't want to join the pantheon of destroyed and failed presidents that embarked upon wars that ultimately were not supported by the American people. And again, if the American people don't support it, forget it. We don't want to do exactly. it. Exactly. And they don't. Is there Finally, is there some good reason to maintain this level of sanctions against Iran. Are we getting something out of that? Well, I think the idea was to destroy the Iranian economy and to bring the nation to its knees. Uh, That's really not what we should be trying to do at this point. I think the president senses that there is now an opportunity for diplomacy, for a new approach to Iran that could de-escalate this uh, set of conditions and produce a positive outcome. Look, This will ruin our economy if we engage Iran in a war. Iran will instantly have support from around the world. They will be the victims of this limited strike that is being discussed. The limited strike idea is sheer insanity. It will provoke a war. Everyone, China, Russia, India, many European states will come to the aid of Iran. We'll end up with a larger coalition of the willing against us than we have seen in decades. I think the president's figured this out. He's got good instincts, but he needs to get rid of the warmongers. He needs to throw these geniuses that want limited strikes out of the Oval Office. The last thing the American first agenda needs is a stupid, pointless, unnecessary war with Iran. And he knows that, so he needs to act. As much as Brett Stevens and Bill Crystal would (laughs) welcome that. Yeah. It's insane. I agree with that. Colonel, thank you. Good to see you tonight. Thank you. 
fricasseed. I, I mean, I, I think with the Tucker Carlson piece, especially that interview, you see the difference between kind of the Warhawk American first foreign policy and then Tucker Carlson's where he's looking for legitimate American interest in the area before wanting to carry out any foreign policy kind of maneuvers. And so that does mean that Tucker Carlson's probably terrible on China and wants tariffs and all that and doesn't really get uh, some of the – a more important kind of economic and interventionist points. But at the same time, at least he understands why war with Iran, uh, you know, would be bad. And just the way he pushes this guy and really, you know, presses him like, hey, like point to an actual American interest here. He says, look, America is an energy exporter now, so we really don't have to worry about oil flowing through the Gulf. That's not an American interest. He says, you know, when's the last time uh, Iranians have carried out a terrorist attack in America? And, and he has to say, well, there, w- there was an attack. Well, it was a planned attack. Oh, they carried out an attack, planned attack. Uh, so he has to even admit that, you know, Iran hasn't carried out a terrorist attack. Um, and then uh, he does point, try to point to, I believe, the um, – Copper core bombs from the Iraq war that, you know, are blowing holes in American armor and killing Americans. I, I don't know exactly how many Americans died there. I think the number is actually under 400 in that fighting. But as far as I think all the evidence says that none of those uh, bombs actually came from Iran, uh, they were all made in Iraq because the United States turned on their Shia allies at one point and started fighting the war against them. I believe this was at the same time uh, that they were fighting the war against the uh, Al-Qaeda insurgency as well. So, I mean, the Iraq war was a complete stupid mess thanks to, you know, John Bolton and like Tucker Carlson said, a lot of the same warmongers uh, back then who were advocating for that war and who, you know, muddled America along the whole way and just kept making it worse and worse. You know, never just realizing that, oh, we're in over our heads, we need to leave. No, then we have to at some point decide to fight against the Shia. And now suddenly there's groups that are linked with Iran and have ties uh, with people back in Iran uh, suddenly fighting against Americans, not because Iran decided to wage a war against the Americans, but because America decided to wage a war against Iranian allies. And that was just really stupid. But now John Bolton uses that, uh, his previous failure, a- as an excuse to try to carry out a-, a new war against Iran. Yeah, he he goes, well, what about the IEDs? What about the IEDs? And just uh, for our listeners, I had a long conversation with Scott Horton recently in an episode that's coming soon. So And he goes into that in detail about how people found machine shops uh, where these IEDs were made. And so the blame on Iran for that is, you know, at best uh, overdone and at worst, you know, just flat out false. So um, just a a heads up for that. But, you know, he he, uh, the two things he calls out are, uh, well, the intelligence, you know, we have intelligence that Iran is, you know, is posing a threat. and They're going to attack us. That's the infamous intelligence that showed up, I think, in early May. And I think that this this latest escalation has been relying on that intelligence that may have come from the Israelis. Uh, I don't know if that's completely clear yet. You know, and then he also falls back on the old what about the IEDs uh, argument where, you know, well, you know, the Iranians killed our troops. And so we have to smash them, you know. But it wasn't until Tucker backed him into a corner that he, you know, he pulled those things out in a defensive, you know, in a defensive way. So there's more to this. Uh, this is, I, you know, I think Kyle and I were talking more about how we could best, you know, serve our audience today and what we should present to you. And we decided that we'll just kind of, you know, tell you everything that we've learned in the past day, because it's, a, there's a lot of stuff going on. There's a lot of moving parts in this um, and a lot of different factions that are, fighting each other both externally and internally, you know, it seemed pretty clear to me that what Tucker and McGregor did there is exactly what Seb Gorka was railing against. People on our own side are, you know, going after John Bolton. I mean, John Bolton was in the crosshairs last night on that Tucker Carlson show. And I I guess now's a good time to mention. So right around the same time or a little bit after this Tucker Carlson um, show aired last night at 8 p.m. Eastern Time, um, though it's probably taped earlier. 
a big article, a, a real bombshell article came out from the New York Times. So this New York Times article came out last night, Thursday night, uh, some, late in the evening. The title of it is Trump approves strikes on Iran, but then abruptly pulls back. And they report that the a handful of uh, that he, that Trump initially approved attacks on a handful of Iranian targets like radar and missile batteries, and then just right before the strike was going to happen, there were ships and planes already in the process of, you know, getting ready to do these strikes, and Trump called called them off, called them to stand down, and the attacks were planned for today, for Friday, just before dawn, and um, you know. It's a pretty big deal. And in this, there's a there's an interesting statement. They say the White House declined to comment, as did Pentagon officials. Then they say no government officials asked The New York Times to withhold this article. So tacit approval. The White House approved this leak, if you will. They talk about, uh, you know, meetings in the situation room. They talk about uh, they call out. The Hawks on this, they say senior administration officials said Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, John R. Bolton and National Security Advisor and Gina Haspel, the CIA director, had favored a military response. But top Pentagon officials cautioned that such an action could result in a spiraling escalation with risks for American forces in the region. Congressional leaders were briefed by administration officials in the Situation Room. And then they um, they give some quotes from Nancy Pelosi. They say that uh, that Nancy Pelosi, um, they say the president's classified briefing in the Situation Room, uh, the, the congressional Democrats were there, and that they urged Mr. Trump to de-escalate the situation. They called on the president to seek congressional authorization before taking any military action. Quote, this is a dangerous situation, Speaker Pelosi said. Quote, we are dealing with a country that's a bad actor in the region. We have no illusions about Iran in terms of their ballistic missile transfers, about who they support in the region and the rest. Um, But anyway, they paint the Democrats as the doves. And what else? What are the other important things in here? Oh, surprisingly, they cite quite a few Iranian sources, not just Gulf Monarchs, funded think tankers, you know, which surprised me. And they even, Kyle, they even cite a translation from Press TV um, where Hussein Salami, the commander-in-chief of the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, said crossing the country's border was our red line. The semi-official mayor news agency reported, quote, we are not going to get engaged in a war with any country but we are fully prepared for war, unquote, Mr. Salami said in a military ceremony in Iran. So, I mean, I I don't know. Maybe it's normal for the New York Times to actually go look and see what the actual reigning commanders are saying and get it from press TV, but I was surprised by it. I don't think I've seen it before. And they mention that this commander says that we are continuing our resistance. So they give what seems like a fairly accurate you know, representation of what the Iranians are saying. Yeah, for I mean, for the Washington Post, that's certainly a, or is this the New York, New York Times? This one is the New York Times, I think. Either other, way, yeah. typically you don't get the Russian or Iranian perspective at all, or if you do, only in half sentences, so you could really make it sound like uh, the Iranians are doing something more, or the Russians uh, typically never get their perspective printed as well. Uh, that You know, I mean, that it, it just seems more nefarious if you use it in half statements. Maybe we'll increase in uranium enrichment. Uh, it is like the only sentence of the Ayatollahs that they'll actually quote. And or death to America or something. Right. Yeah. And they don't, you know, put forward the whole context, which is for the Iranians. They believe that there is a war against their country. I mean, uh, there's been, you know, credible documentation that things like medicine isn't gained into the country. Iranian planes are in rough shape because of the sanctions. Um, and, you know, th- those are direct sanctions and have been on Iran in a long time. And so, you know, think about if in the United States where uh, planes are falling out of the sky a couple times a year and what that would 
would do to kind of our economy and travel and, and stuff like that. I, I mean, it's certainly kind of scary to think about what we're putting that nation through, um, especially when the Iranians, uh, uh, most of them, I'm sure, could remember back to the 1990s when the U.S. waged that uh, sanctions war against Iraq that was actually absolutely devastating to the Iraqi people. And, uh, you know, look next door to Afghanistan, too, and see what happens when America invades your country and have plenty of reasons, uh, you know, to feel uncomfortable with this whole situation and the way America has been treating Iran. And, and so at least you almost kind of get a little of that perspective this time in the New York Times, uh, because it's very important to understand. Of course, even Tucker Carlson leaves it out most of the time. And I guess he goes along. I, don't, I, don't, I haven't heard his position on the, the nuclear deal. But everybody just kind of assumes that it was a terrible deal that Iran cheated on, which, you know, unless you're Tulsi Gabbard, I haven't really heard a politician do a good job of defending that. Uh, but it's really important to remember that the Iranians are following the nuclear deal that prevented Iran and made sure that Iran never got a nuclear weapon, even though, you know, there's no credible evidence to ever say they were going to get one in the first place. Right. And before we get too far into this, um, let's... Let's talk about Moon of Alabama's analysis from this morning titled White House Pushes Trump. White House pushes, quote unquote, Trump pulled back story. He likely never approved the stri- to strike Iran. And uh, Bernard Moon of Alabama cites Elijah Magne, who like immediately protested this article. Uh, Elijah has sources in Tehran. And he said, This is highly inaccurate, and Iran knew about it yesterday. The U.S. administration whispered this information for Trump to save his face. I hinted to this information yesterday before it was released this morning by the U.S. media. Iran sources rejected the, quote, war theater scenario, unquote. More details this evening. So the, uh, the um, the Hill article, I don't have that in front of me. But they reported that today, too, that uh, one of the Iranian officials came out and said, uh, we knew about this. And Kyle, what what were the details on that article? Do you remember? Well, I remember being skeptical because they were all unnamed sources within Iran. But basically, I, I think there were – and th- I can't remember if this came from Elijah or that article. But the idea would be the U.S. would carry out some kind of empty strike in Iran and not hit any actual targets. But, you know, just get into the country and couple fire a couple of missiles in the desert or something like that. Um, right. But- so for, for Trump to climb down the escalation ladder, his idea was to – you know, to appease the the hawks and his own, you know, maintain right. his own reputation. By... But the Iranians said no to that, and yeah. that's important. And, and it, I think that gives a little bit more credit to the moon of Alabama take that this is uh, all theater, because if Donald Trump couldn't carry out an attack in Iran without provoking uh, major retaliation from the Iranians, then the the biggest action he could make is to, you know, sound like he called off the attack at the last minute. And so uh, that ends up being what happens. We got a tweet from Trump this morning saying that the planned attack was on three sites and uh, it sounds like the planes were in the air. And just before they were about to start carrying out the mission, uh, Donald Trump asked one of the generals how many people would die. He said 150. And Donald Trump said, well, that's too many, so I'm going to call this off uh, since America only lost one unmanned drone. So, you know, like it, it seems a little bit to me that this has to be kind of scripted by Donald Trump because it just paints him as way too much of a hero um, kind of in, in the narrative that he tells. And my guess is that uh, maybe not that this was never ordered because I, I certainly guess that Trump could have given the order. But, you know, the high like him and his cabinet and stuff understood that the attack was never actually going to go forward. Uh, but maybe to make it seem more legitimate, uh, like all the orders went out that would have gone out had there been an attack in two hours. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, and so I think there may be a little bit of a, a difference there in that maybe Trump isn't actually technically lying when he says that, that you know, he gave those orders uh, and then withdrew them. Uh, from what I've read on, like, the blogs and stuff, it does seem that um, American planes were in the air. I'm interested to see if we'll see uh, the actual 
uh, equipment that was going to be involved. I think that would be somewhat telling to me if they, you know, had a bunch of F-35 lines lined up, I'd be pretty sure that they weren't actually carrying, planning on carrying out this attack uh, because Iran does have some pretty good missile defense systems. And wouldn't that be a, a catastrophic failure if we try to carry out this limited strike against Iran and, and then, you know, their air defense system shoot a couple of the brand new F-35s out of the air? Or the planes it, malfunction and go down. Seems like it would have been too much of a risk. But if it was just theater in the first place, maybe they did load it up with F-35 and B-2s uh, just to make it all look good. Um, so th- those are some details I'm looking forward to coming out and getting in the coming days. But, I mean, is it, scary as it is, even if this was just a bluff that Donald Trump did it, uh, the, the news that has come out in the past 24 hours and kind of how it has makes me at least think uh, there, there's some possible credibility to Bernard's argument there at Moon of Alabama and, uh, as well with the reporting from Elijah Manier. Yeah, I agree. I don't know that we'll ever find out that, you know, Trump proposed a face saving measure for himself and was turned down by uh, the Iranians. I, I don't know if that part will ever come out. I tell you, though, it does make me wonder about some of the Syrian strikes that he did. And the, it was suggested that it was a staged thing. Uh, I can't remember what was the one, the Conchacoon or, or the other one, but you know, it just makes me go, Hmm. Anyway, just to throw that in there. But yeah. So when well, I, I, to- I think we even, uh, we discussed this when we talked about it at one point that he at least alerted the Russians who we all assume would, uh, alert everyone else, uh, the Syrians and the Iranians as well, that the attacks were coming. So, yeah, yeah. And, uh, the one last thing we really should talk about, if we can squeeze it in here is the attacks that have been going on in Yemen. They haven't necessarily been getting that much attention, but I was looking at South Front yesterday and they put up a little chart saying, just detailing the the Yemen Armed Forces strikes on Abha Airport in Saudi Arabia. So this is the Houthis, and they're the parts of the army that are aligned with the Houthis. And they have missiles. But now they're firing cruise missiles. And something I didn't know until yesterday, actually Moon of Alabama told me about it. They have drone swarms too, Kyle. They're getting new stuff from somewhere. And I really wonder if, you know, Iran has been blamed, Has the, the biggest war hawks have been saying that the Houthis are a proxy of Iran. They've been saying this for a couple of years at least. Um, everyone who I find credible has said that that's not true. Iran does support the Houthis, you know, uh, what they're doing, but they they claim that they really didn't have the means to provide any kind of significant help. And I really wonder if they are saying now as they're, you know, waging their, as, as Bernard calls it, a maximum pressure on the United States campaign in retaliation for our maximum pressure campaign on Iran. You know, Iran is doing their own maximum pressure campaign. Uh, I wonder if they just started figuring, well, you know, we're getting blamed for everything these Houthis do anyway. So uh, let's, uh, you know, let's supply them. Or basically, I don't know who is supplying them, but someone is clearly giving them some new stuff. And they have done, they list a bunch of strikes here going back to August 2016. There are, you know, one in 2016, one in 2017, a few in 2018. And then just in the past month, on June 12th, a cruise missile strike on this airport in southern Saudi Arabia. That's June 12th. On June 14th, an airstrike with several... Kassaf K2 loitering munitions. June 17th, a Kassaf K2 loitering munition. June 18th, an airstrike with several Kassaf K2 loitering munitions. And now, and then, you know, the drone swarm attack. And a really important new strike, which I've seen a number of people comment on. Let me find it in Moon of Alabama's article. They hit a desalinization plant. Uh, which appears to have really scared the the Saudis. It's you know it's a major risk to them, and it seems that 
you know, MBS may be uh, having second thoughts about his aggression toward Iran. And then I know this sounds kind of uh, mixed up, but what we're also seeing is increased pressure from the United States, from the hawks in the United States on Saudi Arabia. Like, for instance, Lindsey Graham was ranting about the Saudis yesterday. The Senate uh, voted. This is a Republican-controlled Senate. So these are Trump-aligned Senate for people who are not in the United States. They voted to um, to ban uh, weapon sales to Saudi Arabia yesterday in the Senate, which is going to mean that in order to override that, Trump's going to have to veto it. That's a big deal. So anyway, there's this strike on the desalinization plant. Just search and find that here. I've got so much stuff. Yeah, if am I could I, just... Am uh, I even making in. any sense here, Kyle? Yeah, you you are, Joanne. And okay. I, I guess I'm going to get in here and say that I've, I, I read similar articles to you, and I've had the same thoughts that you're having now, which is it seems that in especially the past, I would say, like two to three months, the Houthis have increased their military capabilities and have certainly been carrying out more strikes against Saudi Arabia. And so, you know, now we're calling into question how strong the Houthi and Iranian ties are, especially because this has coincided uh, with a ramp up in hostilities and uh, and tensions between the United States, which includes our Sunni Gulf allies, uh, the, the UAE and Saudi Arabia with Iran. So what I'm going to do here is not, you know, just to disagree with you and say that you're wrong, but to give all the skepticism I have of these points. Yeah, Because I think you provide a pretty good case. I'm fairly certain that up until uh, 2017 or so, all the missiles that uh, the Houthis were firing into Saudi Arabia were not I- 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 Iranian, but as reported by Scott Ritter and IHS Jains, the international um, weapons group, that these were converted Scud missiles and uh, were from either North Korea or the USSR, uh, bought by, I believe, Ali Abdullah Saleh uh, back like in the in the like early '90s or something like that. Yeah, so I mean have... they had huge stockpiles in this country of right. all kinds of stuff. Yeah. So, but also in that time, the Houthis fired some anti-ship missiles, including one that hit a UAE ship. Oh yeah. And so I do have some questions as to, you know, maybe they had some upgraded weapons then, or maybe they just had some anti-ship missiles uh, this whole time and really didn't know what to do with them because at one point they uh, fired it into the Red Sea there. And every time they, wherever the missile landed, the U.S. said, oh, it was only 20 miles from a U.S. ship or something like that. It landed close to it and used that as an excuse to actually carry out a couple uh, strikes against the Houthis. Uh, I don't know if you remember this, but at one point the U.S. was directly bombing them because uh, a couple rockets landed out there near U.S. ships. So yeah. maybe th- they had converted some other missiles, and that's what we're seeing in the, with the cruise missiles today. I'm not sure. There's also the possibility, I think, that the Houthis are – I mean, this war has been going on for four four years and three months now. Yemen's a country of 28 million people. It's a pretty large country. If they have, you know, somehow gained, like, the blueprints to build different kinds of missiles and are able to purchase on the black market any kind of uh, different technologies, I mean, think about it. The U.S. has had a bunch of Tomahawk missiles fail out in the, you know, Syrian desert in different places. I think only like nine or 11 of the ones we launched into Saudi Arabia Arabia hit their mark. And I just use this as an example to say there's a whole bunch of like crazy technology floating around the Middle East. I like is meant, we launched into Syria, right? Yeah, Saudi Syria. Arabia. Sorry. Yeah, okay. Syria. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Um, and, and so anyways, the point being just that there's a whole bunch of crazy missile technology floating around the Middle East, and it doesn't seem impossible to me that after this long of a war that the Houthis are starting to just kind of construct and upgrade their own kind of weapon systems to fight against Saudi Arabia. I'll also say that I think events as they've unfolded in Yemen have increased the Houthis' urgency in bringing this conflict to some kind of resolution. I mean, we're looking at a new cholera outbreak right now in the Yemen. Almost uh, three quarters of a million have contracted cholera so far in 2019, over 1,100 dead. The Houthis took unilateral steps to vacate the ports uh, at Hadeda 
and turned those over to the Yemeni Coast Guard. And while the UN has verified this step, the Saudi-like coalition has failed to start to take any steps on their own uh, half in, uh, you know, kind of in, in – Posing or implementing the Stockholm Agreement, and then you also have a situation where the the just the overall humanitarian crisis is getting worse. Saudi Arabia is carrying out more airstrikes against Houthi targets in Sadah and Sanaa and Hadeda, and it may just be desperation time for the Houthis. I mean, at this point, what else do they have to lose? They have to just launch a barrage of missiles and increasingly add civilian targets in Saudi Arabia to try to. I uh, real made the Saudis realize that this war is no longer worth it for them. Uh, I I don't think the the Houthis have much else they could do. It's presented always in the Western media as that they are an Iranian proxy acting on the Iranians' behalf, and it, I'm sure it makes it extremely difficult then for the Houthis to find any kind of resolution that isn't tied around a U.S. deal with the Iran that Trump's screwing up right now, anyways. And so it's it just to me, it, it seems like the Houthis could be looking at this as they are in a possible situation. The only way out of it is to inflict enough damage in Saudi Arabia to get the Saudis to stop the bombing. And maybe that's the tactic going on right now. And it has absolutely nothing to do with Iran. On the other hand, everything Joanne said is also really good information to keep in mind. And it could be that the Iranians are increasingly using the Houthis as a proxy force against Saudi Arabia to inflict pain because of the economic war the U.S. and, again, our Gulf allies are waging against um, uh, Iran. Right. I, that's all really good information. I'm glad you threw that in there. So one thing we do know is that these things are happening around the same time that Iran is pushing back in what they must. It's, it's an incredibly risky effort, what Iran's doing right now. They could very easily end up with serious damage and maybe a whole war on their hands. So, you know, it's a it's a brazen attempt. But, you know, you can see that as Kyle just laid out. The Houthis are in a similar situation. What else are they going to do right now? And I should mention that, you know, it's crossed my mind for what it's worth. This is just my own thoughts. But I, I'm recalling an article from Elijah Magnier laying out what the Iranians uh, see as a four-step um, path for them to follow going forward in order to improve their situation. And it includes a lot of things that are very long-term, like diversify their economy but it also has things in there that says, you know, don't have any sort of legacy allies. In other words, don't rely on these, you know, relationships and uh, alliances that you've had in the past. You know, basically just deal with other countries on a more transactional basis. They do something for you, you do something for them. And that is signals um, anger and resentment at, number one, the European countries who claimed that they would stand by the Iran deal. But it also, you know, kind of calls out Russia and China. They're big allies who they, you know, who could who could change this. All of those parties could change this situation for Iran, but they haven't had what the what Iran sees as a spine and they haven't been willing to uh, put their own interests aside enough to stand up to the United States and to get these sanctions lifted in this, you know, this uh, uh, this economic war, hybrid war being waged on Iran. They are very seem to be very angry at Europe, Russia and China. So it occurs to me that if the Houthi attacks are part of Iran's pushback, their maximum pressure Thing. You know, it could be someone else who's helping out the Houthis. It could be China. <laughs> drone swarms. Who's who's really good at drone swarms? I don't know. Chinese. Uh, you know, it could be Europe. Uh, there seem to be a lot of parties who are uniting to get this war on Iran to stop. It's just that they're not doing it overtly. Um, so I think that that's also worth considering. Yeah, Does that makes sense. Or? Yeah, I was just going to add in here 
that Iran could be, you know, upset with, especially with Russia and China here, as they were supposed to, I think, really be the signatories of that deal that were, you know, going to help advocate for Iran's interests. You know, they sit on the UN Security Council and everything. And Iran did give things up, up front in that deal. Uh, they destroyed the, the AROC reactor as it sat, and I think they're converting it now into, a, a kind of reactor that would produce, uh, you know, off uh, waste that is less likely to be used for a nuclear bomb or less able to be used for a nuclear bomb. So, you know, that's a blow to the Iranian economy or in Iranian's nuclear production capabilities. They either destroyed or sold a bunch of their reactors. They sold off a bunch of their uh, heavy water that they had stored up there. And they also, uh, you know, agreed to reduce the the cap that they enrich uranium down to 3.6%. And so all these were real concessions for the Iranians when they made this deal. And now that the Americans are breaking it again, it's not like Russia and China are standing up for Iran here and saying, okay, well, we, you know, by the way we read this deal, it's okay for the Iranians to, uh, you know, start enriching uranium up to 20% again. Uh, they're, they've been really silent and while that there have been, you know, kind of these general calls for the U.S. to abide by the deal, certainly nothing with enough teeth to actually help the Iranians out at all. Right. So, and you have to remember that, you know, China's right across the Red Sea there in Djibouti. So, um, and you also have to remember that, you know, we had some military bases in Yemen that we had to evacuate pretty quickly at one time. Uh, Houthis were able to move in and, and, and grab weapons. There's also... You know, there's a rat line of weapons into Yemen uh, for, I mean, it's, it's, it's a real mess. You have the, you know, the United Arab Emirates backing some fighters. You have the Saudis backing some fighters. You have, uh, we've I, I apparently still got special operations forces on the ground there. And the Houthis are, uh, you know, they're able to seize weapons from people that they defeat or scare away or whatever. Can I say uh, one thing about that New York Times article that I thought was important uh, that we didn't hit on yet, which is there's a paragraph in there when it talks about the advocates for the the intervention that was uh, Pompeo, Bolton and Gina Haspel. Well, it was the military at, uh, you know, kind of contingents that are the, you know, the, the people of the military, the Pentagon that were urging more caution and, uh, you know, not doing this. So that should really say something that the people who would end up fighting this war are the ones that are saying loudest in the administration not to do it. I think Congress was also lumped in with urging caution, uh, saying that you have to, uh, you know, look for congressional authority. In fact, I even saw Tim Kaine. You know, who I, I think is a pretty kind of centrist uh, Democrat say that they needed congressional authority. And it was bizarre that Trump was trying to tie uh, Al Qaeda and Iran together. So th- those are positive statements. But uh, I just want to point that out because I think that is something important going forward here is that when it comes to the Iran issue, the military is very skeptical about going in there. Under the Bush administration, it was Admiral Fallon that really pushed back against that. And, and hopefully we saw that again this time. Now, I, I don't think uh, the new CENTCOM general, McKenzie, is going to be the guy to stand up. But hopefully uh, this new Mark Esper, who's now the Secretary of Defense, after Shanahan, uh, you know, domestic abuse, he's out for that reason. But at the same time, it seemed like he was spineless and uh, Bolton had just stuck off his people around the Pentagon anyways. And I just not to bright too much, but I was doing a live stream last night with Will Porter and uh, Steve Waskow, one of the bloggers at the Libertarian Institute with me. And we were talking about how uh, we were hoping that the strong military uh, voice would be what could turn this war back. And Tulsi Gabbard, I, I saw, kind of took this stance as well, saying that, hey, there's no war here worth sending our soldiers to die for. Excellent. Yeah, I'm not sure how cut and dry it is with the um, with the military, but they did it before. Some figures in the military did it before, and again, that's that's actually the topic that I talked to Scott Horton about. That was the overall topic of uh, an interview that'll be coming out this weekend, because I reached out to Scott because I wanted to remember how it played out the last time we were close to war with Iran, who shut it down, and how how it happened. And uh, that's what we talked about. So if you're interested in sort of the history of that, in my case, I was hoping that something like that might happen again. 
which is why I reached out. But yeah, just you know, look for that interview coming soon. Well, I'm um, excited for that one. And if there's somebody to remember something, Scott Horton's the guy to do it. That's exactly why I, what I said to him. Um, yeah. So I just wanted to mention one more thing on that. Yeah. So the, there are some changes have happened recently. Um, and I'm, I'm a little nervous about those. The, the new CENTCOM commander came in, uh, I think it was the end of March. And I believe that the chairman of the joint chiefs, Dunford, General Dunford, I believe he, it's close. This is close to the end of his term and he's going to turn it over to, uh, Mally, is it? And I don't know too much about these guys, but I did see a speech that McKenzie, the CENTCOM commander, gave to FDD. FDD is a, a, it's called the Federation for the Defense of Democracies, and they are, they are one of the top characters who are gunning for Iran. And, um, you know, he gave a kind of a bellicose speech there. So I'm a little worried about that guy. And I hope that there are others around who are, you know, counter, if he is, you know, all in for war with Iran. I hope there are others who are, you know, countering his influence. Uh, but to get back to the these strikes by the Houthis on Saudi Arabia, uh, one thing I should mention is that if, if we just lay it out in a very simplistic way, because this is really complicated, uh, not not over exaggerating there, but there's ge- there are generally three actors, foreign allies, who want either a war with Iran or they want to significantly reduce Iran's influence. They'd love to regime change them. If they can't regime change them, they want to weaken them in other ways. And that is the United Arab Emirates, uh, Saudi Arabia, and Israel. So that's MBS, Mohammed bin Salman, MBZ, he's the uh, Emirati Emir, I can't remember his actual name, and, you know, Netanyahu in Israel. Now, Netanyahu's got his own struggles. He's weakened somewhat, at least at home. I don't know about his influence here with the United States. MBS, well, I'll leave him till last. MBZ is apparently the strongest of the three. And MBS is, um, you know, he has on and off come under a lot of pressure from the United States. And I generally use Lindsey Graham as my bellwether for when we are trying to coerce the Saudis. And um, they, you know, we talked about this in, in an earlier set of episodes that Will and Kyle and I did a round table on the Khashoggi affair. And uh, I always thought there was something more going on. And it seems like every time we want to pressure Saudi Arabia, Khashoggi comes up again, right? And it has come up again. The UN issued a report and Lindsey Graham is ranting about the Saudis, you know, again, And, of course, you know, this vote in the Senate and the British actually just did their own kind of vote to ban weapon sales to Saudi Arabia. So now this will all make sense soon, I'll promise. (laughs) There we've had all these attacks in southern Saudi by the Houthis on southern Saudi Arabia. And this more recent one, people seem to think that this one's even maybe more significant than the others. A Saudi desalinization plant was struck. I believe it's yesterday. Moon of Alabama here says there's also a different plausible explanation why an imminent strike might might have been called back. He cites the Wall Street Journal. Saudi plant struck by missile apparently from Yemen. Senior U.S. officials called back to White House after desalinization facility in the kingdom was hit. Senior officials from a range of U.S. government agencies were called back to the White House to meet Wednesday evening, the official said. The president has been briefed on the reports of a missile strike in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. White House Press Secretary Sarah Sanders said on Wednesday, we are closely monitoring the situation and continuing to consult with our partners and allies. Moon of Alabama says the Houthi, a.k.a. Ansar Allah, yesterday hit the Saudi desalinization and electricity plant uh, near the southern city of southern Saudi city of Jazan. The Saudis confirmed this strike, and then there's some confirmation there. Moon of Alabama says, this must have come as a shock for the Saudis. Some 75% of the water the Saudis use come from desalinization plants. 
Their people will die of thirst when those get destroyed. Did the Saudi king call the White House and urge it to call off the strike against Iran because he feared for his water resources? Was this the real reason why the White House called back its advisors and canceled the strike? And then he goes on to list some of the other attacks on the airports and such. So that, you know, another thing to consider um, if you're just kind of considering all the dots, dots that are out there, maybe not connecting all these dots, but sort of taking all these things into consideration. Yeah, I mean, if nothing else, it's important information to know that the Houthis targeted that uh uh, a water treatment distillation facility um, because that if it doesn't show that Iran was involved in giving the Houthis directions, it may show just an increased desperation of the Houthis. Um, one thing I want to bring up about Lindsey Graham is that I'm pretty sure he's still hawkish on Iran, even though he's a little bit better on the war on Yemen right now, because I think he just feels personally slighted by Mohammed bin Salman uh, for killing Jamal Khashoggi. It, I, I guess like he has said, oh, this kid's a good guy or something at some point and felt stupid that, you know, he showed himself to be a murdering idiot. Um, and I, I saw in an interview, uh, that was on Fox News, uh, with Daniel Davis. They play a little clip there from Lindsey Graham and he says, oh, you know, the U.S. should respond. And if Iran, uh, you know, starts enriching uranium even more, then we have to do something to take out, uh, you know, their nuclear capabilities. But he has to like kind of walk it back because, you know, this is a guy that already says that Iran's on a path to the bomb and that <laughs> the nuclear deal put Iran on a path to the bomb. So he has to like kind of try to walk this line where he's like, oh, this is them going back on the path to a bomb, but they were on there all along. And that's <laughs> kind of stupid. But uh, that's that's Lindsey Graham for you. Yeah, he's a mixed up, muddled up, shook up or something like that. So, yeah, so let's say that this drone incident actually isn't what sets off a greater conflict between the U.S. and Iran. I do think there's a couple more uh, tripping points. Joanne has done a pretty good job of covering uh, the Yemen angle, and you know that could certainly be used as one of the excuses. Although, if it escalates enough and Yemen or the Houthis are able to inflict damage on Saudi Arabia, maybe it works the other way and is a deterrence for that war. Um, but I, I thought it was interesting that, you know, they're claiming that if the attack is in international airspace versus Iranian airspace is the difference maker here. Oh, yeah. And if, and I, I just think that's a dangerous distinction just because even if the, that spy plane is 20 miles off the coast of Iran, if it's taking in like data on where Iranian missile positions are, that's a threat to Iran. And so I could see why Iran, with all the threats coming out of the U.S. and from hots like Graham and uh, Rubio and Bolton and Pompeo, who all all hold important positions to Donald Trump, Tom Cotton's another one, uh, that Iran would feel like that's a threatening act for the U.S. to be flying a spy plane, even in international waters, but clearly trying to collect data on Iran. Um, the other one I have is just in Iraq. There's been two or three times in the past two weeks where some kind of mortar or rocket fire has landed in or near an Iraqi base that either housed or oh, yeah. Americans were near. And every article on these reports will say the tensions with Iran, oh, there's Shia militias backed by Iran uh, running around in this area, and oh, this could set off a conflict with Iran. Maybe they throw in a little bit of Hamas and Hezbollah in there just for, you know, some good fear mongering. And then at the very bottom of the article, it'll say, ISIS actively operates in this area, and uh. that's why the U.S. forces are stationed there. And so they're really priming people to believe that if, let's say, you know, very unfortunate, a mortar fire hits a U.S. you know soldier somewhere in Iraq, I think it's going to be instantly blamed on Iran. But anybody who's been paying attention to this at all and knows that there's a whole bunch of ISIS jihadists still running around this area all because of John Brennan – and I, Joe, and Joe, we'll just have to yeah. link to the episode for anybody who wants to know about that. Um, the, running around the Levant. And so that means that these crazy people would certainly be the ones willing to try to set off a war between the U.S. and Iran. I, I mean, I'm sure to them, the overthrow of the Ayatollah is a dream, you know, that, that would be great for them. And if they could set off that war, the, the U.S. war hawks may certainly again, uh, be playing into kind of the jihadist hands here. Yeah. Yeah. The answer to the qui bono question is, let's just say complex, right? <laughs> Put it that way. Always. Uh, yeah, yeah. 
All right. Well, I think that's probably enough dots for, for people to decide whether to connect or not. Kyle, we could, we could go on, but um, let's wrap up this, uh, this update here. Thanks so much for coming on the show again. And uh, I'll talk to you soon. All right. Thanks so much for having me out, Joanne.